<laughs> okay, so uh, the yesterday went out, or, or yesterday, was it yesterday? I guess it was yesterday. When we were running the notebooks, uh, they weren't working properly. All I did was reboot Ubuntu and everything's fine. So I think the notebooks are okay. Um, if you're running into the same issue, and I know at least one other student had trouble with the notebooks, um, it's probably that Ubuntu, and your, uh, if you're on Windows, your uh, Linux uh, app program has been running for too long. You haven't closed it in a while. Things get messed up. Uh, so just reboot Linux um, and uh, restart Jupyter. Everything should be okay. All right, so we we're talking about the binary representation of integers. So uh, the unsigned integers, I'm pretty sure you all know how to represent unsigned integer numbers. Uh, the question is, is how does your, or how are signed integer numbers represented on a computer? And the answer is that uh, at least today, so in modern times, almost all desktop computers, um, most handheld computers as well, uh, use something called two's complement. But this wasn't always the case. Uh, so in the early days of computing, uh, there was no standardized way of representing signed integer numbers. Some people, you, some computers might have used two's complement. Some use something called one's complement, and somebody, some computers used uh, um, a signed integer representation where there was a one bit reserved for the sign. The C standard, because it's been around, uh, because C is meant to work on any computer architecture. Um, previous versions of the standard didn't actually say how integers should be represented. So uh, you might have a binary encoding of an, of an integer on one computer that is completely different than the binary encoding of an integer on another uh, computer. Almost all computers nowadays, though, use to, to use two's complement. So the C23 standard is supposed to say uh, all integers shall be uh, represented using two's complement. So what is this thing called two's complement? So it more or less works the same way as unsigned integers, right? So every binary digit is simply multiplied by some power of two, right? So the least significant bit is multiplied by two to the zero, but your most significant bit is raised, is multiplied by two to the whatever exponent that happens to be, but that value is negative. So if your first bit is zero, then, your val then the value of your number is exactly the same as though this were an unsigned binary number, right? Because it's zero times that bit, uh, zero times that multiplier, right? So it doesn't contribute to the sum, right? So the uh, binary number 01101011 is still 107, just like it was when you, we had unsigned numbers, right? Now, if that bit is a one, so if I change the first bit to a one, so we have one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, one, right? Now that not, that bit there multiplies by minus two to the seven, right? And so this represents a negative integer number, right? So notice that two to the seven is one greater than the sum of all of the other um, exponents so added together, right? So two to the seven is minus 128. If you sum up all the other exponents, that's 127. So if there's a one in the first, uh, in the most significant bit, then your number is guaranteed to be negative, right? So if you sum those all up, you get minus 21 in this case. Okay, so if you have a two's complement number, um, the largest value that it can represent, right? The most positive value you can represent, that first bit has to be a zero, right? Otherwise your number is negative. All your other bits are one because you want to maximize the sum. Right? So in an eight bit two's complement number, the largest value you can represent is 127. Right? So that's the most positive value. What is the most negative value? Right? So the most negative value obviously has a one in the first bit. All the other bits must be zero. Right? So one followed by all zeros is the most negative value that you can have, and that's minus 128. Right, and notice immediately that there's something funny happening here. Right, the magnitude of the most negative number, 128, is greater than the magnitude of the of the largest positive number. Right, and so what does that imply? Right, 
if I have if I start with the most negative number and negate it, I can't represent that value. Right? So minus 128 is representable. Minus minus 128 is not. Right? It doesn't, it would be 128, which doesn't fit in the range of our of, of, uh, of the two's complement representation. Right. So minus X may not exist, right? So if X is a two's complement number, right? Negative X may not exist. Right. I can't even negate the value without something funny happening. You can't take the absolute value of the number without something possibly funny happening. Right. The absolute value of minus 128 is 128, which you can't represent. Right. You can't multiply the number by minus one. Right. Minus 128 times minus 1 is 128, right? Which you can't represent. You can't divide the number by minus 1, right? So notice that you can't even do the most basic arith arithmetic operations with 2's complement uh, and not run into the possibility that the result may not be representable, right? In the C language, these all result in undefined behavior, right? So if you uh, have some code that writes minus x, and x happens to be a signed integer value, right? It is the case that there uh, that the value of minus x may in fact not be correct. So uh, undefined behavior is this term that shows up all the all over the place in the C standard. Undefined behavior literally means anything can happen. Uh, so um, in these particular in these cases on most computers. The program will run. It won't crash, but the result will be um, will be incorrect mathematically. Right. So let's see what happens if we actually try this on my computer. Right. So I have a signed car. Right. So this is definitely this is on my computer. It's an eight bit twos complement number. Right. Uh, the constant s car min is the most negative uh, signed car value. Right. Those constants are defined in limits.h. Right, which I've included up here, right? So I'm going to start out with, uh, in this case, minus 128. Right? I'm going to print the value. Right? I'm then going to compute minus C, right? Which should be 128, and then print the value. Right? I'm going to take the absolute value of C, which should be 128, multiply C by minus 1, divide C by minus 1, and on my computer you see, right, that starting out with a negative number, and multiplying it by a negative number ends up with a negative number, right? So in other words, you don't get the, uh, so you, we already know you can't possibly get the correct answer. 128 doesn't fit in the range of uh, an 8-bit signed, uh, an 8-bit twos complement number, right? On my computer, you just get back the original number. Okay, so fortunately, there's only one value for which this is true, right? The most negative value can't be negated. You can't multiply it by negative one. You can't divide it by minus one. You can't take its absolute value. Right. Okay, so suppose uh, you have a two's complement binary number, x, and you would like to compute minus x, right? And so it turns out uh, there is a neat way to do this, right? So you want to negate. Uh, a two's a two's complement value, so there is an algorithm for doing this, right? So it turns out what you do. So for almost every value x, right, the trick the algorithm is flip the bits of the number, so zeros become ones, ones become zeros, and then add one to the flipped uh, by to the number with the flipped bits. Right. Okay, so I'm going to start out with the decimal value what. Right, so it's binary representation. Oh, oh, sorry, that didn't work. Zero, 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 one. I would like to compute minus one. Right, so flip all the bits. Right, so all the zeros become ones. So we now have one, 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 zero. Right, and now add one to the flipped bit uh, number. Right? Now, when you add one. So adding two binary numbers works the exact same way as adding two decimal numbers, right? So that long addition form uh, algorithm that you learned when you were six or seven or eight, right? It's the exact same algorithm, right? So here I'm going to do one, 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 zero, plus all zeros and a one, right? So starting at the right-hand side, zero plus one is one, right? 
one plus zero is one and so on and so on and so on. Right, so you get all ones. Right, compute the sum. That's minus one. Right. So positive one, all zeros followed by a one. Negative one, all ones. Okay, suppose I have the, va the value 56, right? So that's 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. I would like to compute minus 56, right? Step one, flip all the bits, right? So zeros become ones and ones become zeros. Add one, right? So add all zeros and a one, right? Use the long addition for, uh, algorithm that you learned way back in grade school. One plus one is zero carry the one, right? So one plus one is zero, carry the one over to the next digit, right? So one plus one plus zero is zero, carry the one, right, over here. So one plus one plus zero is zero, carry the one. Now I have one plus zero plus zero, and that's one, right? And all the other bits, you can just add um, just by looking at the bits, right? So zero, 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 one and zero is one, and one and zero is one. Right, compute the sum and you get minus 56. Right, so it's it's relatively straightforward to, um, so even for a human, it's relatively straightforward to compute uh, negative x given some uh, two's complement number x. In your, in your On your computer CPU, there's actually hardware that does this, right? So if you send the operation minus x to your CPU, the bits get flipped, the bits of X get flipped, and then one gets added, right? So it turns out this is very easy to implement in hardware, um, which is one of the reasons why two's complement uh, representation is used. There's other advantages to the two's complement representation as well. If you add two numbers together uh, in two's complement, um, you just use the long addition uh, algorithm that you learned in grade school, right? The exact same algorithm works for two's complement. For the other types of uh, integer representations, the straightforward algorithm doesn't work anymore, right? You have to account for the sign bit doing something else, right? But with two's complement, the sign bit gets handled um, just fine, right? Overflow also happens the way you uh, would probably expect it to happen, right? So if you sum or subtract two, uh, two two's complement values and the result overflows, the resulting value uh, is the value that you would expect given that overflow has occurred, right? And you can try it out if you want to, to see what happens, right? So take um, zero and then all ones and add one to it and see what happens, right? That's the most positive value. When you add one to it, it should overwrap around and go back to the most negative value. And you can easily confirm that is the case. Okay, so remember the binary representation, these numbers, we're going to come back to that in uh, um, in the next notebook. Uh, right, so if you're doing math with, um, if you're doing any kind of math uh, and you need one of the one of the standard library math functions, the header file that you normally include is math.h. The exception is if you're trying to do some arithmetic operations or some, sorry, mathematical operations using the integer values. Uh, in that case, they're probably in standard lib.h. Um, strange, but that's the way they've organized the uh, libraries. Right. Okay, so if you want to do something like take the absolute value of a integer number, right? The function is abs. It's defined in standard lib, right? If you want the absolute value of a floating point number, the function is called fabs and it's in math.h. Now remember there uh, in C, um, any name that has external linkage has to be unique, right? Which means all of your functions have to have, all of your non-static functions, their names must be unique, right? There is no function overloading in C. So, there isn't just one version of ABS. There's a different version for every numeric type. Right. So if you have a long integer value, so that's value two, and you would like to compute its absolute value, right? That's the LABS function. If you have a long, long integer value and you'd like to compute its absolute value, that's LLABS. Right. If you have a double floating point number, it's FABS. 
And if you have a floating point absolute number, I forget what the function is called. I'm sorry, if you have a float, I forget what it is. Uh, but uh, because there's no function overloading, there are multiple versions of functions. Their names typically differ uh, in a single letter. So if you're wondering why is there an ABS and LABS and an LABS, it's because there's no function overloading. OK, so that's the integer types. Now, what can you do with the integer types other than basic arithmetic? Uh, so we don't talk about this in Java uh, in 124. Um, but because integer, well, all values on your computer are just binary values, right? Everything's just zeros and ones. Um, it is possible to operate on the zeros and ones, right? So in other words, you can actually compute stuff using the bits of stuff, right? And so these are the bitwise operations. In both Java and C, the bitwise operations are defined for the integer types. OK, so on your actual computer, right? So your physical computer probably cannot manipulate individual bits one at a time, right? So you can't go into memory and say, I want the bit at address, I don't know, 137 on your computer and flip that bit, right? So that doesn't work on a modern computer. Modern computers work on chunks of bits, right? So what are called words. Um, so. On a modern computer, it's probably 64 bit words. So your computer can manipulate 64 chunks, uh, memory in chunks of 64 bits, or that's what it wants to do anyway. Uh, it is very unusual for a CPU to be able to address a single bit. Right. Uh, however, being able to manipulate single bits turns out to be very useful for some applications. The applications are pretty niche, right? So they're not very common. Most programmers don't need to do this all the time. As computing science students, though, you should understand or should know that these things are possible and um, you should understand the basics of how these things work. Right. So um, these operations aren't normal, aren't things you would normally do. Right. Typical programmer, especially if you're programming on the web or something like that, you're never going to use these operations. If you're writing a compiler or if you're doing some sort of high performance application, uh, you may be in the situation where you need to employ these tricks, right? So because these tricks are unusual, they're unusual. Um, it's, they're often not taught at undergrad anymore. Um, and so the number of people who know how to do these sort of things is decreasing all of the time. Uh, fortunately, someone actually wrote a book uh, that explains how all of this stuff works. It's surprisingly fat, given that you're just flipping zeros and ones. Right, that book is called Hacker's Delight, uh, which you can look at. Uh, you can try to track it down. I don't know if the library has a copy of it or not, or if we have access to it or not. Um, but given that all you're doing is flipping zeros and ones, it's a lot bigger than you would think it would be. Um, if you've heard of uh, Donald Knuth, um, he's famous for many reasons. One of the one of the reasons he's famous is for writing a set of uh, books called The Art of Computer Programming. Right. It's still a work in progress. He's been working on this for decades now. Um, I think he's in volume five right now. Volume four talks about uh, bit flip, uh, bit manipulation tricks. OK, so the bitwise operators in C and in Java, they work on any of the integer types, right? So they don't work on the floating point types. Um, because of the way, because unsigned and signed integers are represented differently, right? So remember, signed integers are two's complement. Unsigned are not, right? When you apply the bitwise operations, they behave differently if you're using signed or unsigned numbers. OK, so I need to be able to print up. So in order to illustrate these, um, these techniques, it's useful I can actually print out the binary representation of a number. C doesn't give you a built-in way to do that. So in the notebooks, this function is going to show up. Right, so there's print B, so print binary. The type is always going to be U int something, right? So U int 8 is unsigned int 8 bits, right? Uh, so the there are standard types, or there's, you know, there's standard types uh, that correspond to fixed number of bits. Right, so if you're in the situation where you actually need to specify a fixed number of bits, there are a set of types that you can use for those purposes. Right, so uint8 underscore t unsigned int 8 bits. 
uint uint 16 underscores t unsigned it 16 bits and so on and so on and so forth right where are these defined uh standard types i think uh do i tell you somewhere there's a header file that uh, standard int so they're in standard int if you uh, want to know what they are right so that little function there you shouldn't be able to read right now and understand by the end of this lecture well the end of this lecture or the next hopefully you'll be able to decipher this uh function and figure out exactly what it's doing right but i claim that that prints out the binary representation of the unsigned 8-bit number x okay so the bitwise operations there's not many of them which is good uh good news for you right so bitwise not simply flips the bit right so not zero is one not one is zero Similar to uh, the Boolean not, right? Not true is false, not false is true, right? So for single bit not or complement, flips the value of the bit. Okay, so in C, there is an operator uh, that is the tilde. Sorry, if you can't read that, it might be a little bit small for you, right? So it's the tilde is the uh, not operator, right? So you can apply not, to any integer value, right? And what that does is it flips the bits, all of the bits of the integer value, right? So if X is some integer type, then Y equals tilde X is the bitwise not of X, right? Bits in X that are zero become one, and bits, uh, sorry, are one in Y, and bits that are one, uh, zero in X become, and bits that are one in X become zero in Y, right? So for example, if your X is zero, 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 Zero 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 one zero zero one zero, right? Flip all the bits, and that's the not of x, right? Taking bitwise not of a value is equivalent to what's called the ones complement of the value, right? Remember twos complement, you do the not and then add one. So there's my print b function. Ignore that for now. Down here, I've got some values to print out, right? So there's the uh, uh, number 18, right? And there is the bitwise not of whatever was in X, right? So whatever value 18 is in binary, uh, Y is going to be the not of that, right? Print them out, see what we get, right? So there's X, right? And there's not X, right? All the bits have flipped. Okay, so most general purpose processors use two's complement to represent signed integer values, right? And in signed integer, remember to get uh, to compute negative x in uh, two's complement, you flip the bits, add one, right? So if you want to compute the negative value of x, right, given some integer x, signed integer x, sorry, you could do it that way right there, right? Flip the bits, so that's not x, add one. Remember one in as a decimal number is just zero, 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 and all the way at the end, one in binary, right? And of course this doesn't work if X happens to be equal to int min, right? If X is the most negative integer value, playing this trick doesn't give you back the negative value of X, right? Because it doesn't, you can't represent it, right? Run the code and away you go, right? It actually does work, right? So, when you actually print out neg x, you actually do get minus 99. Right? So that algorithm I described 10 minutes ago really does in fact work. Right? OK, so that's a bitwise not. So not surprisingly, there's a bitwise or and a bitwise and. Right? And they do exactly what you were taught in your logic course. Right? If you have two uh, bits x and y, then and is the and or conjunction operation. Right, so X and Y yields a bit whose value is one if and only if both X and Y are also equal to one, right? So just imagine one is true and zero is false, right? So false and false is false, right? True and false is false, right? False and true is false, true and true is true, right? So exactly the same as in logic, right? So some of you in 124, when you were writing your conditions, you probably wrote if something and with a single ampersand, right something else right 
Uh, and in C, you can do the same thing. And in, for the most part, it works, right? But when you're writing that, you're actually not using logical and, you're using bitwise and, right? So the bit, uh, actually doesn't work in, uh, I don't think it works in Java. I don't think the single and, well, I don't remember now. Anyway, in C it works, right? Because C assumes that uh, any value that is uh, not zero is true. So uh, the single ampersand is the bitwise and, right? If you want to do logical and, use the double ampersand, right? If you want to do bitwise uh, and, it's the single ampersand, right? And so all that happens here is you go bit by bit and take the ands with the two bits, right? So if x is that value there and y is that value there, when you take the and, you get zeros everywhere uh where there's uh not two ones right so the only location where there are two ones is here and here right so you get a one in the end everywhere else you get a zero so does this actually work well here's 18 and 206 right there is the and of the two values right run the code and print them out and let's see what we get right so there's x in binary there's y in binary there is the and in binary, right? Everywhere there's uh, everywhere where there's two ones, there's a one. Everywhere else, it's a zero. Right. Okay, so this turns out to be a lot more useful than you think it's going to be, right? So for any bit x, the following is true, right? So regardless of the value of x, x and zero is always zero, right? So in other words, something and false is always false x and 1 is always equal to x, right? So if x is 1, 1 and 1 is 1, right? But if x is 0, 0 and 1 is 0. Okay, so now things start to become a little bit more interesting. So if you've got a pattern of zeros and ones, uh, that pattern of zeros and ones you can call, uh, you can treat as though it were what's called a mask, right? So using a mask, so using some pattern of zeros and ones, I can select specific bits from an integer value, right? Using bitwise and, right? Using this trick here, right? So if I want to pull out specific bits from some number x, right? I can create an appropriate mask, right? And pull out those bits exactly, right? So for example, suppose I want to know what is the value of the bit in the rightmost location of x, right? So what is the least significant bit of x, right? So what you do is, is you create a mask, right? Everywhere where you're interested in the value of the bit, you put a one, right? Everywhere else you put a zero, right? So my mask is all zeros and then a one because I'm only interested in that bit right there, right? If I wanted the first bit, I would put a one here and then I'd put zeros everywhere else. Right. If I wanted the first and the last, there would be a one here and a one there. Right. So create your mask. Take the end of the two values. Right. So when I take the end of the two values, I get a zero here. Right. Which is equal to the zero that's there. If X has a one there. Right. And I use the same mask. Right. Then in the result, and then after you take the and with the mask, you get a one in that position as well, right? And so playing this trick, right, you can do something like determine whether or not some integer is even or odd, right, without having to use the remainder operator, right? So I can determine if a number is odd with that line of code right there, right? So X is my number. My mask is one. So remember what one is. One in binary is just zero, zero, da, 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 one, right? So there's a one in the uh, least significant bit, right? Why does this work? Right? Because if I take any number x and end it with one, right, the result is either all zeros and one or all zeros and a zero, right? If there's a one here, in that bit, right? What does that mean? Sorry, let me erase this forward because I'm going to, it looks like it's going to be useful.
Right, so imagine I have some binary number. 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, da, 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 da. and then a 1 here. Right, remember what that 1 means. That's multiplied by 2 to the 0, right? So that's 1, right? And then you sum all the other values here, right? If there's a 1 hanging out here, right? This, uh, oh, that sum here is even, right? Because these are all, uh, these are all values that are raised to the power of two, some power of two, right? So that sum is even plus one means the number is odd, right? So if you've got a bit, if your rightmost bit is, uh, or your least significant bit is a one, you've got an odd number, right? If your least significant bit is zero, right? Then you've got an even number, which is why that trick there works. And it works with signed values as well, right? It doesn't matter if it's signed or unsigned, right? So minus three is odd. Go ahead and change this to something else. So two, for example, right? Run that, run that, two is even, right? And this will work for any um, value of X that you, can, uh, that you can type in. Figure it out yet? <laughs> I thought on the top I said that X and one is equal to X. Sorry, what's that? Uh, I thought off the top it said. Does it say? Oh, I never mind. No, yeah. Right. So, so that's a simple. So that's there's a little example of determining whether or not a number is even or odd, right? And um, you can easily come up with lots and lots of other little examples where it's useful to be able to pick out specific bits of a number. But let's continue for now. So what about the bitwise or? Right? So bitwise or works like logical or, right? Uh, as long as one of the two bits is one, the result is also one, right? So in other words, you only get zero if both bits are zero, right? The bitwise or operator is the single vertical bar, right? Double vertical bar is logical or, right? Single vertical bar is, is bitwise or. So if I take the bitwise or of X and Y, anywhere there's two zeros, I get a zero. Everywhere else, I should get a one, right? So two zeros here, I get a zero, right? Two zeros here, I get a zero. Everywhere else, uh, I get a one, right? If you write down X and Y, which are 18 and 206, right? Take their bitwise or and print out the values using our print B function. Right, you get exactly what the example shows you. Right, everywhere there's two zeros, you get a zero. Everywhere else, you get a one. Right, now remember for bitwise and, right, x and one gives you back x. Right, for bitwise or, x or zero gives you back x. Right, x or one always gives you back one. Right, anything and true, anything or true is true. If X is one, then one or zero is one, right? Zero, if X is zero, zero or zero is zero. Okay, so bitwise and lets you pick out a bit. Bitwise or lets you make sure a bit is equal to some value, right? So using a mask, we can ensure that a subset of bits from a integer value X are equal to one while, re while leaving the rest of the bits unchanged, right? So I can set, I can make sure some bit in the number becomes equal to one without changing any of the other bits. Right. So if X is this value here, right? So that's the decimal value 18, right? If I would like to toggle that last bit to make sure it's one, right? Then I can use a mask whose values are all zero. So anywhere it's a zero, it's not gonna change the bit of X, right? Anywhere it's one, it is gonna change the bit. Right. If I compute the or, right, then the result is X, um, except the last or the most significant bit is now a one. Right. Sorry, that doesn't actually change X. Right. The result is um, X, uh, where the la uh, is X and the last bit of the uh, and the last bit is now a one as well. Right. 
Similarly, if the if that bit was already a one, right, then applying the mask doesn't do anything to the original value. Right. So that uh, X and the mask is just equal to X in this case. OK, so instead of setting the least significant bit, right, you can set a specific bit. Right, for example, the bit corresponding to two to the power five, right? So that's the sixth bit from the right, right? By taking the or with 32, right? And you might say, well, that's weird. Why am I doing that, right? 32, remember, is, um, uh, where's the, do I have it written down somewhere? Uh, so 32 is gonna be, sorry. So there's zero, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. Two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, two to the three, two to the eight, two to the five. Right. So that's 30, uh, 32. Right. So if I use that as my mask, right, and I take the or with x, you end up getting a funny result. Right. Okay. So here is a string, right, equal to all the uppercase letters A through Z. Right. I'm going to write a loop that loops over all of the characters. Right. I'm going to extract the character from the string. I'm going to take the or of that character with 32, and I'm going to print out the result. Right. And what do you end up getting? You end up converting all the lowercase letters to uh, all the uppercase letters to lowercase, right? Um, so there's a cute trick, right? This only works if you're actually using, um, in this case, ASCII or uh, uh, or the Unicode standard, right? The reason this works is because the difference between these two, um, remember, cars are just ints, right? So the difference between these two happens to be 32. Right. If I turn off, if I force that bit to be equal to one, right, it turns out that turns uh, it converts the uppercase letters to lowercase. Right. So that's cute. OK, so there's one more. Uh, there's one additional operator that you normally don't learn about in 124. That's called XOR. Right. So XOR is exclusive or. Right. Uh, and so. Uh, XOR is like OR, except if both values are one, the result is also zero, right? So exclusive OR means one of the two values is one, uh, then you get one, right? If both values are zero, you get zero. If both values are one, you get one. Otherwise, you get one, right? So anywhere in these two numbers where you have zero and zero or one and one, you get a zero, right? Everywhere else, you get a one, right? So zero and zero, I get zero. One and one, I get zero and so on and so on and so forth. Okay. okay, so if you take those two numbers again and compute their exclusive or, right, you get back the exact same net values as in the result. Uh, sorry, as in the example above. Okay. All right, so if you take the, oh, so the caret operator, sorry, I forgot to tell you that, right? The caret operator, Shift six on a standard US keyboard um, is the bitwise OR operator. Right. So for bitwise OR, uh, X, X OR zero is X. Right. Oh, sorry. For bit X, the following are true. X OR one is not X. Is that right? Or is that a typo? X OR one is not X. Uh, that's not true. Right. X, no, no, that's not true. That's got to be a typo. That's better. Okay, sorry. If you, uh, yeah, so somebody is fixing my notebooks for me online. I don't know who you are, but someone's reading them and pushing changes or notifying me that there are corrections to the notebooks on GitHub. Whoever you are, thank you. Right, uh, fix that error and let me know that it's there. Right. So that should be uh, the XOR, right? So XOR zero is X and XOR one is not X, right? And so using XOR, 
you can flip the value of a bit. Right? So you create a mask, right? Anywhere where the mask is one, the corresponding bit in the other number will flip. Right? So if X has a zero where the mask has a one, then when I take the X or that bit will flip. Everything else will stay the same. Right? So that that bit uh, that bit now flips to one. Right? If I have a one here and I take the X or with a one, then that bit, this bit flips to give you zero here. Everything else stays the same. Right? So X or lets you toggle uh, a bit. So using the same alphabet example, I can now toggle back and forth between uppercase and lowercase, right? Instead of using or uh, to switch from lowercase to uppercase, sorry, uppercase to lowercase, I can go either way, right? So starting with the all uppercase letters, right? If I compute the XOR with 32, that goes to lowercase. Right. Starting with the lowercase letters, if I compute the XOR with 32, right, that goes to uppercase. Right. Or will only go from lower uppercase to lowercase. It won't do the other way around. Right. So if you start out with a lowercase letter and take the uh, OR with 32, you get some funny result. All right. Shifting bits. So if you have a binary number, some pattern, right? Some pattern of zeros and ones, right? You can shift the entire pattern left and right using a bit shift operator, right? And you can normally shift by some arbitrary number of bits. Right? So given an integer value, uh, an integer value, you can shift the bits k positions to the left or the right. Right? Okay. So in C, that value of k should be zero or positive, right? So it shouldn't be negative. Um, if you pass in a negative value for the shift amount, uh, your code will probably compile, but the result is undefined. So it may not do what you want. Right. Uh, also, if you have an eight bit number, you normally cannot shift the bit by uh, the number by more than eight bits. Right. So that value of K is constrained by the number of bits in your number. Uh, it's actually one minus, I think, the number of bits in the number. Right, so if you have a 32-bit integer number, at most you can shift by 31 positions. Right. Again, if you try to shift by more, the result is undefined. Okay, so the complicate matters, uh, there are two kinds of shifts. Right, There's something called a logical shift, and there's something called an arithmetic shift. Right. So a logical shift is what happens when you have an unsigned number. Right. Now remember, if you have a signed value, the most significant bit is important, right? If it's one, the value is negative. If it's zero, the value is positive, right? So arithmetic shifts take into account the sign bit, right? So you have to be a little bit careful. Um, uh, so you have to be a little bit careful about uh, which one is happening. Okay, I wanna take a number, I wanna take a binary number and I would like to shift the bits to the left, right? So. Do, 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 do. This value is oh let me look at the uh, let me look at the picture first and then we'll come back to the text. Okay, so here I've got this binary number one one zero one zero zero one one. Right, I'm going to shift the bits two positions to the left. Right, so starting at the right hand side, right that one moves two positions uh, to the left. Right, so the one ends up here. Right, this one goes two positions to the left, so it ends up here. Right, anything on the right hand side falls off. Right, so that one gets shifted two bits to the left, it just falls off the end of the number. Right, and that one gets shifted two positions to the left, so it falls off. Right, over on the right hand side, right, what happens is zeros get shifted in to fill in the missing values. Right, so one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, when I shift two bits to the left, becomes zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. Right, this is for an unsigned number. Right, so notice. Imagine that this was a signed number, right? That's a one, so that number was negative, right? If you shift two bits to the left, the resulting number is positive, right? So this this is a 
this is showing you the correct result if the shift is a logical shift. Right? So in other words, working with unsigned values. Right. If you were to, let's go back up here now. OK, so consider what happens mathematically when you shift bits to the left. Right. So here I've got a, a number B0, B1, B2, dot, 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 right? However many bits you have. If I shift K bits to the left, right? Then you end up with the following number, right? So you end up with all of the bits of the original number, right? And then I end up with K zeros on the end, right? So imagine that there's no limit to the number of bits that you can have, right? If you work out the value of Y, sorry, it's right there, right? The value of Y is equal to X times two to the K, right? So if you shift left one bit, that's like multiplying the number by two, right? If you shift left by two bits, that's like multiplying the number by four. Right. If you shift left by three bits, that's like multiplying the number by eight. Right. And this works exactly the same as what happens if you have a decimal number. So if I have a number. Well. Right. And I shift the digits one position to the left and stick in zeros at the end. Right. So that's like so shifting. One digit left is like multiplying by 10. Right. If I shift that two digits to the left, that's like multiplying by 100. Right. And so on and so on and so on. So the exact same thing happens in binary. Shifting left by k bits multiplies the number by 2 to the k. Okay. Now, what happens? If your number is a signed value, right? So if your number is signed and no overflow occurs, right, then you get the exact same result as in a logical shift, right? So if no overflow occurs, you shift left by k bits, right? That's like multiplying the number by two to the k, right? Now, the funny thing here though is that. Um, the exact binary number that you get, right? So the pattern of bits that you get depends on how you're representing your integer numbers, right? If you're using two's complement, there's still a one and your number was negative and no overflow occurs, there's still a one hanging out in the left-hand bit, right? In the most significant bit, right? And so in other words, that shift doesn't actually push the one off the end. If overflow occurs, then something else happens, right? So if overflow occurs, a negative number, it may no longer be negative, it may be positive, right? A positive number may no longer be negative. Yes. Oh, never mind. It's just someone outside. Right. Right. So in two's complement, a arithmetic shift is identical to a left to a logical shift, uh, except if overflow occurs. Right. If overflow occurs, then what exactly happens depends on your um, particular CPU. Right. So how do you shift left in C? It's the less than less than operator. Right. So X less than less than K shifts X K bits to the left. Right. If K is negative or if K is greater than or equal to the number of bits in the value being shifted, the result is undefined. For unsigned values, the result is always a logical shift, right? For signed types, the result is an arithmetic shift if there's no overflow. If there's overflow, then the behavior is undefined, which means don't shift on uh, signed values, right? Unless you're sure that the result is not going to overflow, right? Because you will get uh, an unusual result um, if you're not expect uh, if you're not uh, expecting it to happen. OK, so I'm going to shift a unsigned integer value a few times. So I'm going to start with 23. I'm going to shift it where to go. I'm going to shift it once to the left. I'm going to shift it twice, three times and four times. Right, the fourth one is going to overflow. So let's see what happens when we do this. Right, so there's 23. 
shift the bits one position to the left. Right, so all of those go one position to the left, right? And that equals 46, right? two times 23. Shift everything two bits to the left, right? So now all the bits go over here, right? They move two positions to the left. Zeros come in on the other side. Sorry, zeros come in on the right-hand side. We get 92, right? Which is 23 times four, right? One more time, you get 23 times eight, right? Notice there's a one hanging out here, right? So this is unsigned, so the result is still positive. If this was a signed value, suddenly this value becomes negative, um, which is strange, right? Now, shift one more time, right? And notice what's happened, right? Our original leading one, which was back here, has fallen off the front of the number, right? So 23, this should be times two to the, what? That's times two times four times eight. This is times 16, right? Doesn't fit inside the range of our eight bit int, right? And so you get overflow, right? And the result is now uh, less than shifting the uh, number three, di three digits to the left, right? Uh, so overflow happens the exact, what happens in overflow is exactly what you would expect would happen, right? That bit just falls off the end of the number. All the other bits shift to the left. Uh, and there's the result there, right? So you still get overflow, right? Overflow still is still possible uh, because we have a finite integer representation. Okay, so I guess we should, uh, well, we're over time. So I guess in the next lecture, we'll finish off this uh, notebook. You think? I wanted to be I couldn't get that instrument as simple. Um,